All right, guys, I'm also recording myself as I teach you this today because there's another class that I can't go to. Um, so we're going to record it so that they have me too because I am awesome and I would hate to deprive somebody of me. Uh, if you don't know me, I am O'Neill. Uh, if you do know me, I'm also O'Neill. Uh, we are going to learn how to use the Promethean flip charts today. Um, you're going to use this to make your presentation for your poet rather than to make a PowerPoint or something like that uh, because this is a little bit more interesting. Also, this is a software that you could theoretically use at some other point in your life if you're doing a presentation process in a certain college or something like that. Promethean flip charts are cool because they're interactive and you can do stuff using the board with them. Uh, but really, it's kind of almost like PowerPoint on steroids. Uh, or another way to think of it is it's, it's kind of like a, um, I hope I'm getting a shot here. Uh, it's kind of almost like a word processor for whiteboard drawings. If you've ever used, and probably a lot of you have used Photoshop or Microsoft Word or stuff like that, a lot of the same sorts of stuff apply. Uh, you can really get in and mess around with it and um, basically just save frequently. And that way if you keep trying stuff and it screws you up, just go back to a previous version and you don't lose anything. Um, follow along with me if you want on your own computers, or just get into the program and mess around with it, or just listen, whatever works best for you. Uh, every once in a while, though, I'll say, write this down, and those are the things you should probably actually write down. Um, if it's not on your desktop, it might be on your desktop, I don't know. Click Start, All Programs. It's called Active Software, Active Inspire. And open that baby up. Obviously, you guys don't have the pen. Um, if you do, shame on you. Please give it back. The handout I gave you is just basically a quick little explanation of all the tools that are available for Active Inspire. Hang on to that. Keep it. That way, if you forget how to do something, you've got that. If it tells you to download a new version, just click Cancel. Don't do that. And you probably also get this little dashboard thing. Just cancel out of that, too. There might be another thing that asks you if you want to use Active Studio or Active Primary. I think you can cancel out of that too, or you might just choose Active Studio. When you open it up, it probably looks like this. It might look like that. If it looks like this, if you don't have the browser window on uh, the left-hand side of your monitor, click View Browsers. All right? All right, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to go through... Um, I'm going to go through the basic tools, and then I'm going to go through what lives in the browser window, and then I'm going to go through and kind of show you how to um, how to uh, how you could use it with your poet. Unfortunately, yesterday I had an example flip chart that I got from Coach Anderson, and I forgot to save it on my flash drive, uh, but that's okay because I can kind of demonstrate as we go along. All right, so let's start with the basic tools. Kind of looks like a Photoshop or word processor or whatever toolbar, or almost really more like Microsoft Paint or something with the colors and the erasers and the thingies over here. Uh, the one you're probably going to use the most is the pen tool, which lets you draw, and the grab tool, which lets you grab a thing that you've drawn, maybe, and move it around like that. After you've drawn something, it becomes an object and then you're able to manipulate it. Which means you can resize it and change its transparency and stuff like that. Bottom right hand corner, you see a circle that's got a line across it. That lets you resize proportionally. If you resize with any of the other circles, it stretches and squashes. So if you make a thing and you want to keep it the same proportions, you have to use this size down there. All right. That applies to any tool you use on this toolbar. So if I click the shape tool and I want to make a circle, I can make a circle, then I can grab the arrow, grab it, resize it, or squash it. All right? There's a tool palette right there. If you click, it's got a hammer and a wrench right there. If you click that tool palette, it just gives you the same options that live up here. I'm old fashioned and old, so I always go to that because that's what I'm used to using. But 
I'm going to go ahead and grab this shape again and show you, when you have a shape selected, there's a bunch of stuff you can do to it. Um, the first one over here is just a mover. If you grab it by the little crosshairs right there, it lets you move it around. Nine times out of ten, you don't need to use that. By the way, I'm a little bit sick, so my voice is going to crack several times like a 13-year-old boy. Just ignore me and we'll go with it. Um, if you drag this around, it does the same thing as this. Every once in a while, specifically when you've embedded a video or something, uh, you can't just grab it and drag it. And that's why that is still there, even though it's kind of old-fashioned. Uh, next to it's a rotator. Like that. Next to that is a drop-down menu. You probably will only use the drop-down menu if you want to lock um, lock something you've made or drawn or, in, or uh, embedded on here if you want to lock it down. To do that, you just click locked, and you can no longer move it around. All right? That's good for if you, during your poet project, say you, like, you wrote some text on the screen, and you wrote the name of your poet, and underneath that, when you did your presentation, you wanted to be able to write stuff about your poem, but you didn't want to accidentally grab the thing when you're writing and move it around. You can lock it down. Now, when you're in designing the thing, if you decide later you'd like to go back and change that again, you can do that. And here's how you do it. Top right-hand corner of your monitor, you see a little blue rectangle. Not this blue rectangle, this blue rectangle. This blue rectangle lets you toggle between design mode and presentation mode. If it's blue, you're in presentation mode, and that's the mode you want to be in when you're showing it to the class. When you're in design mode, it's red. When something's in design mode, I can move this even though it's locked down. And I can even go back to my menu here and unlock it if I wanted to. There's a couple other reasons you'll use design mode later. For instance, um, we're going to use some actions, like if you want to make some text appear and disappear, I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, but you need to be in design mode when you're making it, and you need to be in presentation mode when you're not. I'm almost certainly going to remember to come back and show you that, but if I say I'm done and I haven't talked any more about that, remind me. Other things you can do in here, this changes the transparency. So I can make it slightly see-through, like that. Uh, that's a good way to highlight text. By the way, with text, you want to use a light color on a dark background or a dark color on a light background. If I use, um, just switch to the pen, maybe. If I wrote with this yellow on this white background, people in the back of the room are going to have a little bit of trouble seeing it. But if I wrote on top of my slightly transparent window, it's a little bit easier to see. I read somewhere recently that you can see black on yellow or yellow on black. That's like the best contrast. That's like the best thing that you can see. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to go with it. Um, let's see. I shouldn't have deleted that yet. Um, so that's transparency. Uh, All right, so now I have two rectangles. If I want to bring this one to the front, there's a green triangle on top of a um, green rectangle. If I click that, it brings it to the front. If I click the other one, the rectangle on top of the triangle, it sends it back to the back. So if you have you've got a bunch of different stuff in your flip chart, and you want to um, put different things behind, I can select that, and I can just start stepping it back one by one or bring it forward or do whatever I want to do. And that works like any word processor program. If you don't know that, anytime you insert an image or something in a word processor, you can bring it to the front or send it to the back, just like that. <coughs> um, what other? There's a highlighter tool which basically just makes a, a line that's transparent slightly. There's an eraser tool. The eraser tool only erases stuff you have drawn. So if I use the eraser, it'll erase the highlighter, it'll erase the pen, but it will not erase shapes, or if you put an image into it, it won't erase the image. Um, it only erases stuff you've drawn. 
if I wanted to make like a flow chart for my um, for something in my poet presentation, like hypothetically say I put the poet's name here and I wrote the symbolism here and I wrote the rhyme of the ancient mariner here or whatever, um, I can lay those out. And then right here, you see there's connector lines. If I select that, I can pick one of these options. I'm going to take the dotted line. And then when I hover over a shape, it'll find the magnetic points. <coughs> and it'll connect them. Like that. Now when I grab my arrow tool and move them around, I failed to connect it there. They stay connected. All right, and let's just pretend that I got it right on that one. But you see what I was trying to do. If I take the connector, hooray, I got it right that time. So that's just a way you can make flow charts or infographics or something like that using Prometheus. Um, this is the media browser. It lets you insert media and stuff. We will come back to that later. Uh, next to the media browser is text. Text lets you type text as opposed to drawing it out. Nine times out of ten, you're probably going to want to type the text so that people can actually read it. Choose a font that people um, can read in the back of the room. I prefer fonts that do not have serifs. Do you guys know what a serif is? This is the letter T without a serif. And then if it's got these sort of delightful embellishments and becomes a serif font. In general, it's easier to read sans serif or serif fonts without serifs. We use the serif fonts for titles and things like that, but in your actual text, you probably want to use the non-fancy fonts. Cursive fonts, not good for you know, writing too much of stuff. Uh, little Windex bottle lets you clear stuff. If I hit clear annotations, it will delete anything I've drawn or handwritten. If I hit clear objects, it will basically delete everything else, images, stuff I've inserted. There's also clear grid, clear background, and clear page. Later on, I'll show you how to put like a graph paper grid on the back or um, a background image. That would clear those out. And clear page would just delete everything you've done so far. Um, questions on the bottom part of the toolbar? Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, let's talk about the top part of the toolbar here. Uh, there's a little blue rectangle up at the top. The blue rectangle lets you go to desktop annotate mode, which basically means if I want, if I'm teaching a class or if I'm giving a presentation and I want my students to say, all right, don't forget the writer's notebook on the desktop, I could do that. Or I could have a website up and I could, um, unfortunately, I forgot to switch. So I could have this website up, and I could be highlighting text within the website. That's how you can change the size of the pen. You can. Um, so I could be highlighting stuff in there. But in general, you are probably not going to use this feature. But you're probably going to click it by accident and get stuck on your desktop. To get back into your regular flip chart, all you got to do is click the little blue rectangle again. Not that blue rectangle, that blue rectangle. Also, when you create, when you open a desktop flip, when you create a desktop, try this again. When you go to the desktop, it automatically creates a new desktop flip chart up here. I'm going to delete it right now, but it just makes another flip chart. Um, next to it is desktop tools. That's even more confusing than the desktop annotate if you get stuck in it because all that appears is this little circle. And if it decides to appear over here, it really looks like an icon on your desktop. Or if you have a web browser open and it decides to appear up in the top where it's gray anyway, it's really hard to find. So all of a sudden, you know Active Inspire is open, but you don't know where in the world it is. Look for the little circle. Tap it, it becomes a bigger circle, and at the very top, there is a, um, there's an icon that looks like a white rectangle with a Promethean pen on it. If you click that, you go back into regular thing. 
Um, that's so a teacher could have a calculator on your desktop or something like that, but, or on-screen keyboard, sorry. Um, but you're not going to need it. On-screen keyboard is annoying. You can bring it up if you want it, and you can type with it. But you guys sit here and just find new letters in fact. I never use it. There's also an undo button down here at the bottom. If you screw something up, you start hitting undo until it goes away. That's what I do. It's just not going to work right now. So. Um, this is page one. If I want to add a second page, there's a white rectangle with an arrow. I click forward, and now I'm on page two. Anytime I'm on the last page and I click forward, it just adds a new page. So there's four pages over there now. <coughs> this is called the page browser. I can jump back to a previous page on the page browser. I can jump forward. In general, though, the page browser is there for, for when you are designing the flip chart, for when you are setting the thing up. I probably would not want this visible when I'm presenting to a group, because if I do that, it uh, kind of gives away what's coming in the future. So you got a couple of options. In the top of this window, and it works on the toolbar on the other side too, there's a little pin icon. If I unpin it, it jumps over to the side. If I want it back, I tap it or hover over it, and it comes back in, okay? And then I can pin it back down so it doesn't keep going away. Next to the page browser is the resource browser. And this is where you get your, um, this is really one of the main things you're going to do when you make your presentation. This is where you get all of the resources and cool stuff for backgrounds and buttons and things like that. So if I wanted, I'm going to go ahead and just skip ahead to a blank page. If I wanted to go ahead and put a, a background behind my slide, I can click backgrounds and I could look for photograph, and I could find some. So, so let's say hypothetically my poet that I'm doing wrote a poem about caves. I don't know what poet that would be or what poem, but I have a cave picture, so we're going to go with it. All I have to do is grab that, drag it in, and it becomes the background of my flip chart. Now this is where you need to think about your color choices, because if I'm writing text on here in black, I was going to go with Patrick, but I ran out. I do know how to spell my name. Um, <laughs> it becomes hard to read because of the background. So a trick I can do to fix that, if I wanted to, I could just make a rectangle. I could make that rectangle white. By the way, right here, if I select white here, the outline is going to be white. If I select, select white up here, the fill is going to be white. So if I wanted it to be white outline, blue rectangle, I would do it like that. All right. But I want just white on white. And I'm going to draw a rectangle over well behind my name. Okay? But if I still wanted to see the picture behind it, I can do that by just changing the transparency of the thing. And now my misspelled name stands out, but I can still see the image behind it if I wanted to see the image behind it. Text always goes to the front in Active Inspire. There's a trick you can send the text to the back, but like if I select this rectangle and I start hitting bring to front, bring to front, bring to front, it won't do it. It won't pop up in front of the text. Okay? The trick for doing that, if you absolutely must have handwritten text or typed text behind a rectangle, is you go into the next browser and that is the object browser. The object browser is exactly like the layers palette. If you've ever used Photoshop or, or any sort of drawing program or something that has layers in it, okay? If you don't, if you've never used that, you might just want to erase this part from your brain. Uh, but basically what I could do is I could grab that shape that I just put, see the shape, it says shape, middle layer, pen, top layer. The pen always defaults to the top layer, but I could grab the text I can grab the shape and drag it up to the top layer like that. And now you can 
can see the text got a little bit lighter. That's because that transparent thing is now on top of it. Okay? Probably not going to need to do that, but if you do, there it is. Back in the resource browser, there's other stuff you might use. I told you there's grids. So if I wanted to put lined paper on top of my background, I can do that. And now I have lines. That might be handy if you wanted to write about your poet up here and make it on a line or whatever. Um, there's graph paper. If you use graph paper, it hides the background. The background is still there. It's just the back. The graph paper is so busy, it makes it harder to see. Um, there are, under lesson building tools, it's really for teachers to make fancy flip charts with buttons and icons and stuff, but you guys can use that stuff too. So if I wanted, I think you have to have a quiz at the end of your poet project. By the way, if, if we're going with the same rules that Coach Anderson is, and I'm sure that Mr. Avery is going to tell you all about that, uh, in general you're supposed to have an action on every page. Uh, an action is something that it does. Because if I just bring up a picture that says my name, that's I could do that in, in PowerPoint. It's when you want when you have the sound effects and when you have the stuff that moves and does magic stuff. That's when it gets cool. Which I'm going to get to that. Don't worry. But if I want this button, I just drag it in to wherever I want it. So maybe that's answer to the quiz number. That's quiz answer number one or quiz question number one. And there's quiz question number two. And I think you run out of after seven. I think you run out of numbers. But I'm also pretty sure that I can somehow get the seven off of there change it. Maybe this might be one of those times where we go into design mode that lets you do that. Or maybe not. Well, if you need higher than seven, I think you're out of luck. You have to just make a new circle and write it in again. But, yeah, there you go. Um, so, play with the resource browser. Play with all the stuff that is in there. There's a resource pack, and it's not installed. Somewhere there's a resource pack for poetry. And I'm going to see if I can find that for you guys and get it installed by the end of the day today. Um, I've emailed one of, my, one of my colleagues who did my job last year and asked her if she knows where it is. Um, but I'm going to hunt it down. And then that will give you some pictures of poets and some other stuff that you can use. Uh, there are other resource browsers up here. Or excuse me, browsers up here. There's one if you want to put notes for a page. This one gives you some information about the stuff on your page. You're not going to use those, but you are going to use the one that looks like a top up at the top. That's the action browser. This is one of those places where you want to write this down if you are not writing stuff down. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my page with a three on it, and then I'm going to select my page browser, action browser, sorry. And here's how, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this three, and I am going to make this three uh, be able to disappear and reappear. This is really handy because say you write a quiz question on your page. Then when you tap the page, the answer to that quiz could appear. Or I could have written at the top of the page the title of one of my author's poems. All right? And then when I want them to see maybe some imagery that he used in that poem or maybe some actual text from that poem, I tap the thing and it appears. Here's how you do that. You do not have to be in design mode, but you do have to select the object that you're going to make appear or disappear. And then you come over here to the action browser, and you scroll down until you find the word hidden. This works on anything. It works on text. It works on handwritten stuff. It works on images you put in. So here we go. Right here it says hidden. I'm going to bring that up closer to the top. Hidden. Down here at the bottom of the uh, action browser window now, it says action properties target. I'm going to click the three little dots by target, and then if I had ten things on the page, I'd have a list of ten things right here. Right now, I've only got one thing that I drew. So I'm going to select pen one, I'm going to click OK, and then this is the part that I always forget. Way down at the bottom of this browser window, I have to hit Apply Changes. If I don't hit Apply Changes, it won't work. Now when I come over to this number, if I tap it, it disappears. You see that little play button that appeared there? That tells me that the object has 
an action associated with it. There's a million different actions you could use. I encourage you when you have time, when you're building your chart, to go through these actions and see what they do. There are actions in there, and I don't have time to go through all of them right now, but there are actions that do stuff like if you have one image up, it would switch it for another image. There are actions that change the transparency. There are all kinds of stuff. So go through here and mess with them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. For now, though, that's the one I wanted to show you because that seems to be the one that people are using the most. Um, so that is that one. Oh, here's uh, two important things. Number one, if this has disappeared when I saved the flip chart, when I reopen the flip chart, it will be disappeared again. It will be invisible. So you have to think about when you first click forward to this page in your flip chart, what do you want your audience to see? If you want to click forward and then see a blank page and then you reveal it later, you need to make sure that when you save it, you're in invisible mode. Anytime you're not sure where something is, or like if you're practicing delivering the flip chart before you perform it for a class, if you go to design mode, it will appear. And if it's got an action associated with it, it gets a red box around it. That's handy because I don't know how many times I've done an action like this and I've been teaching a class and I've gone, all right, this is awesome. Nothing, because I forgot where in the world I put the stupid thing. So you have to make sure you know where it is before you actually before you actually present it. Make sense? Um, and that shows you that. Let's see what else we've got. Alright, so now the last couple of things that I want to show you. Um, you can insert stuff into this. So if I wanted, uh, there's two ways I can do it. I can use the media insertifier over here. And it also lives up here in insert. So if I go to insert media, and then I'm going to navigate, you would be going to your uh, H drive. I'm just going to a flash drive I bought, with, brought with me. So if I want to insert this image, there we go. Um, fun fact about JPEGs, though. If I use a JPEG, that's any uh, image file type that ends in .jpg or .jpeg, a JPEG does not have a transparent background. So if I want to put this... Oh, that was cool. I forgot about that. Another thing you can do is use a white rectangle on a white background or blue on blue or green on green to hide something. As long as you know where it is. And then when the time comes, you can reveal it like that. Magical. Um, the other thing you can do, if I lock down, remember I told you you can lock stuff? If I lock down my white rectangle, now I can't move it. But I can still move the stuff that's behind it. So if I have on my arrow, maybe. Yay. I can make it appear and disappear. Um, but I kind of failed here because what I was going for was a different color rectangle, which I do need to unlock. So to unlock it, I go to Action Browser, get my drop down, unlock it, and now I have a rectangle that I can move around. I'm going to send this rectangle to the background. And now you can see, because that's a JPEG, it has a white background around it. It's not transparent. So if I want that image to sit in front of anything except something that's white, it looks wrong. The answer to that is when you are, when you're downloading your images, look for PNG files. This is a .png. A PNG is just another image type. And when you put a PNG in your document, there's no background. You can see through it. How much time do I have left? 15. I'm sorry? 15. 15? Cool. Uh, so this is a PNG as opposed to a JPEG. All right? Inserting images is easy. Uh, inserting media is pretty easy, too. So uh, right here, I've got National Anthem MP3. Open it. And what's going to happen is I get this little speaker icon. I'm in design mode, so I have the red box around it that shows it's an action. I'm going to go to presentation mode, and now when I click it, it plays. You 
can also link it to an image. If you don't want the little speaker to appear, um, so I'm going to select this big tool thing that I've got here. Uh, I'm going to get the drop down. And in there, you see insert link to a file. And I'm going to link it to the national anthem. Just say yes on everything that pops up after that. And then, when I click it, the national anthem will play. And I didn't have to have the little, I didn't have to have the little speaker right there. All right? Um, so that is uh, audio in a thing. You can insert video in a flip chart as well. There's a couple ways you can do that. If I go, let's just... Alright, here we have a YouTube video of a kitten who is confused. Um, it's very cute to watch. <laughs> Clever title of this video is Fluffy Kitten is Confused. All right, so you get the idea. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to right-click on the URL. Maybe. It's hard to, to right-click with the pen. And I'm going to copy that URL. And then I go back to my active inspired chart. The first way I can put video in is insert link website. Paste it into the dialog that pops up. And now I have a clickable link. So I can go, boink, and it'll take me right back to that website. And there's our fluffy kitten again. I could also, if I wanted to, take an image that I had inserted. Ah, oh, that's right, sorry. Um, I could also take an image that I had inserted, insert link to file. I have inadvertently lied to you. You can't apparently attach um, a link to that. But what you could do if you wanted to, um, let's try this. I'm click forward, and I'm going to get this link. I'm just going to tell you what I was going to do, because to actually show it is going to take me like five minutes with a pen, where if I was typing on a computer, I could make it easy. But what I would do, if I wanted to do that, is I would insert the link the way I showed you, and I would go to design mode, I get the red around it, I can edit it in design mode, and I can make it transparent. Now if I put that over my bat signal, and just remembered where it was, which I do not, I could click it and it would take me to the video, and it would give me the impression of clicking an image and magically going to the video, but not. Does that make sense? It's just a trick. It's a way to trick the. It's a way to trick Active Inspire into doing stuff that's cooler than it can actually do. Um, I can also embed a video. Uh, if you've ever used the internet or put stuff on Reddit or whatever, you've probably done a little bit of embedding. But if you have not, here's how you embed. Embed code is different than the URL of the website. If you try to use the URL to embed, it will not work. What you do is on your YouTube, or it also, well, you can't use YouTube at school, but um, uh, you guys can use uh, SchoolTube, or if you, um, we will be presenting up here. So if you have a video inserted, embedded in your presentation, theoretically it should work if you're logged in, you know, you log in from the teacher's computer. But you definitely want to test it first, okay? If you get up front and you hit play and the video is not there, you're going to lose points. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to click share, and then uh, the op down at the bottom you have options. This is just the URL. It's a shortened version of that URL. So you're going to want to click embed, and it gives you an embed code, which is just a snippet of HTML. I'm going to click on that, right click on that. That was cut. I'm going to refresh the page because I'm dumb. Uh, share, embed, copy, I guess cut would have worked, wouldn't it? I go back to inspire, and now I'm going to insert link embedded HTML. I'm going to paste that embed code in, and now when I click OK, 
the embed code, the video will actually pop up in the Active Inspire document. So I could be sitting here, teach, 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 skip ahead, kitty cat, and it works like that. So now I have the kitty in the document. If you want to move this around, the only way I've found to do it is draw a box around it first, because if I try to grab it to move it, it just plays it and stops it. Drag a box around it, design mode, drag a box around it, find this place. Oh, there it is. There's the little grabber. Remember I told you sometimes you actually have to use the grabber? Uh, I just totally lied to you. Again, because if you just grab in the blank space next to the video, it moves. So. I don't know what I'm talking about. So there you go. Uh, you could also insert, um, if you've downloaded the video, here's something to write down. If you don't know about KeepVid, uh, there's a website called keepvid.com. Uh, that's not a pen. Uh, K E E, let me try this all again. K E E. P V I D. Keepvid.com lets you download video from YouTube or Vimeo or I don't know where else, but other I've used YouTube and video. Vimeo. Keepvid.com lets you download the video or it lets you download just the audio from a video. Now you always have to make sure you've cited stuff properly and you always have to make sure that you're within copyright. Um, but Hypothetically, let's say you have a poem that your poet wrote, and there's a good performance of some professional actor reading it online. You could go to KeepVid, you could download the text of that, or download the audio of that, and then use it in your document. What you would do is you would go back to YouTube, you grab the URL, you copy it, then you go to KeepVid, paste it in, and click download, and it'll download. It's a pretty cool trick. Um, but after you have downloaded it, insert media kitten.mp4. At this time, you just get an icon from your media player. Since at school we use VLC, we get the little VLC traffic cone. At home, you might have QuickTime or you might have Windows Media Player. But again, if I click it, it's going to open up my media player, maybe, and play the video again. Okay? Um, questions? Did I skip anything you want to know or cover anything too quickly? In general, you can make any flip chart as cool as you want it to be or uh, as boring as you want it to be. Um, I would err on the side of cool because that's how you get better there. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go back in a second.